I'm here today to talk about uh, both affording the educational experience in the traditional fiscal sense, but also from a design perspective of what affordance really is. So think of affordance as the reason why you don't need a uh, instruction book to use a Crayola or to how to turn a doorknob. And I'm thinking if we get a little bit more of that into our education that we might be a little bit more successful. Uh, key to all of this and what has got me most curious about it is why people are so angry. Uh, along with uh, many of you have been watching the Occupy stuff over the last year. And it's pretty clear that something is happening between when we start school and when we end formal education. And whether that's high school or post-grad or especially post-grad, there's something transformational taking place. And I don't think all of it is working quite the way that we intended. Uh, uh, so here I have a picture of Aristotle and Alexander, and everyone I think knows the story here that goes back up through Socrates. It was all about the dialectic. It wasn't about someone like me lecturing someone like you. It was about two people discovering a truth that was greater than one that either of them might come up with by themselves. Um, today, pedagogy is often dominated by an ever-increasing uh, uh, bushel full of, of PhDs on what's right and what's wrong in teaching and how do we save the third world and um, we heard some great talks earlier today about things like gamification. You know what, I don't know the answer. Uh, I think maybe all of it's right, but I know that in toto, in some today, that not all of it is working. Uh, maybe if you have, have probably either participated in or, or heard about the uh, Marshmallow Challenge, it was actually part of a previous TED presentation. Right, so it's this exercise in rapid prototyping and integration where kindergartners um, continually kick ass on uh, MBAs. So uh, something is happening between that point in time when we are three, four, or five years old and hardwired for innovation and teamwork and uh, what happens to us uh, later on in life. I'm interested specifically in who gets left behind. Um, famously, we've had government initiatives like No Child Gets Left Behind where we've used ever-increasing amounts of funding and standardized tests and, and you know volunteer programs and I, I think a lot of it has been very effective but the truth is that no matter how much money we're spending and how much time people are putting into this we're having people get left behind sometimes it's the depressed person by some measures that we today are facing levels of depression that are 10x an order of magnitude from a hundred years ago I, again I'm not here to tell you all the reasons why and, and I'm not the sociologist that figured that out You've got the unemployed MBA, you've got the PhD graduate, you've got the MD, he's been working solid for 26 years, he might be taking home 18,000 and he might be suffering on $450,000 of debt. Um, some part of his life is satisfying to him. Then of course you have the unemployed and then the chronically underemployed, which we don't talk enough about in this country. And I'm not saying that everyone is unhappy, I'm just saying that the societal gestalt is pretty unhappy, and I haven't even gotten to Greece yet. <laughs> not all systems fail. Not all systems of pedagogy fail, not all systems of learning fail, and not all social systems fail, but just many of them are. And again, I'm not gonna figure out all the reasons for you today why that is the case, but I want to explore it just a little bit, maybe just to get us all collectively thinking about it. It's sort of a, uh, let's look at the forest instead of the trees when we look at education design for once. Um, I'm interested in why kids are bored, and in a pandering nod to our sponsor today, I wanted to point out that there were no results for, for kids being bored at, at Eastside Prep. On the other hand, there were results. There were lots of results. There were lots of results of kids being in school and being bored. In fact, they're so bored, they take pictures of themselves being bored and put those online. <laughs> I, don't, I don't see a lot of science and technology and engineering and math. I see a lot of art. It's like drawing on your hands is pretty popular. Um, holding your face. Uh, those are all within uh, the realm of, I guess, creativity. They've looked to me more like what a kindergartner might do. So it, it makes me wonder why we aren't meeting these people where they live, that what's happened to the affordance of education where the lecture format is just letting these, these people down. They're not engaged. And I'm not, this isn't everyone, of course, but if I can grab this many this fast, then there's an issue. There is one that I'd like to point out here, though. <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, that is, who said that? That is engineering. So, th you know, that's, that's what I went to school. But if I had built that next to my glass trophy clay case in my middle school, my um, <laughs> equivalent of what Jeff Adair does would have made my life um, of quite difficult. That's more than just engineering. That actually gets back to Aristotle and the golden mean. That's a, that's a Fibonacci sequence. That's some really advanced math. Those kids don't know that. They're just having fun with it. But through their boredom, they, al they almost got back to that marshmallow test, sort of in spite of their system, not because of their system. They took a bunch of chairs and probably risked uh, detention and all kinds of other bad trouble. <laughs> An area that's been covered at some length today, so I won't go into a lot of detail on this, is just the ever-increasing cost that we're putting more and more money into our, our education system. But not only that, I mean, we could have an uh, entire homologous conversation about our healthcare system, which also we can agree maybe isn't giving us the best results, cost-benefit analysis. Um, what really makes me sad, though, is that even though all of these numbers are going up, that are adjusted since 1980, income hasn't at all. So that long middle class dream that higher education might allow me into the middle class or keep me into the middle class or maybe even boost me up a level and somehow that would make me happy, well, that turns out to, that turns out to have been a hill of beans. That turns out to have been a contract foisted on people, I think a little bit unfairly, and now we have the data to prove it out. And these guys, for-profit education. So for-profit education, praise, this is on, TV all day long, don't ask me why I know that. Uh, and, and they market to veterans, they market to the people that were underserved, they market to the people that frankly were frequently left behind by more traditional aspects of the educational system. Well, there's good news about people like this in that after six years or so, about one-fifth of them graduate. The, the not so good news is that after about three years, one quarter of them are already in default. I don't know if we're giving these people the promise they want either. I, I don't know, some of them are huge successes because there are plenty of them willing to go on TV, but in general what we know is that these kinds of for-profit online is under a little bit of pressure, that we don't have it wired, it's not firing at 100%. Does that mean it's fundamentally broken? No. Does it mean it's not worth pursuing? Not at all. Um, we heard earlier about MITx, edX now, Khan Academy. These things are huge. But some of these for-profit institutions are, are well, I think that they, they might be on the system altogether, something that's more of a negative than a positive. That doesn't mean that we won't get it figured out. It just means that we don't have it figured out yet. So I've been talking about people being sad. So, and it brings up this idea of subjective well-being that, again, a trained sociologist, I'm an engineer, a trained sociologist could tell you a lot more than, than myself, but really it's a, it's a subjective measure of happiness. And there's been a phenomenal amount of research in this area over the last hundred years or so. There's been a lot more qualitative uh, research that's taken place, even historical to that, but I want to talk about the quant side. Um, this is easy to read, right? My science, technology, and engineering and math degree makes this just look completely, no, somebody, somebody missed something here. Um, what, it's, what this is looking at is uh, Japanese um, GDP per capita based on their well-being ordered prohibit index. And what it's really telling us is that since 1968, people in Japan are getting less happy. Now, we don't really need this chart because we can look at other, other measures like the suicide rates that have gone through the roof there, um, the kind of, uh, uh, issues that they're having with the way their age demographics are stacked. And the first world is having problems, and Japan um, is on the front of it. I've got a few other examples here. This is up through 2007, because this data takes a long time from an epidemiological point of view to compile, but this is uh, pretty much all of Europe. I'd love to see what this looks like since 2007, especially Portugal, Italy, Greece, and Spain. People are getting less happy. At the same time, people's incomes aren't going up, and even for the people who, who, are, who are getting higher incomes, what we're finding is that uh, they, it, yeah, it can make you happy up to a point. But maybe people have seen the, the recent numbers that around the 70 or 80K mark, your happiness does, ceases to go up, and after that it actually ceases to go down. So this myth of correlation of dollars equaling success 
equaling self-actualization. Oh, we all might be able to know about that. We joked about it in our college uh, dorm room. Well, it turns out to be real, and it turns out like it, that it might be not just a outcome, but it might be a causal symptom in all of this. <laughs> just thinking out loud. So what do we do about it? Well, maybe give people other dreams. You know, when I was in kindergarten, I wanted to be a basketball star. That's not true, I wanted to be a pilot. But I, um, these people uh, are tremendously successful people, but at their root base, they're entertainers. And at their root base, they aren't the product of a successful educational system or a broadly deployable, portable uh, social framework for success. Yet there are heroes, and there are heroes to an increasing number of, of our young folks. Uh, and that's not the answer. Likewise, I don't think that some new theory uh, on pedagogy is necessarily the answer, or that we go back to you know, Montessori or kindergarten or something else. I think that the answer has to do with looking at where people live today. And we've heard a lot about kids being digital natives. We've heard a lot about the tools that they use. They're a different set of tools. I had textbooks. Does anyone here remember having to like wrap and cover your textbooks in, in brown paper bags so it wouldn't fall? Oh, yeah, it's really fun. Um, I'm looking at this screen here. This kid has got a, a Kindle, but I'm up in the upper right-hand corner. I see two laptops and an iPhone, and I don't know how many remote controls that go to other screens. That's, that's, that, that's where that kid is living. Now, I'm sure the kid gets out and runs around outside for 60, day, uh, for 60 minutes a day, and he's physically active. But, but, but this is an ecosystem that, in many ways, a school, I, I think, is failing to address. We'll talk about that more in a second. Now, STEM. We've been hit over the head with this for a long time. This is the answer. This is how we compete with China. I'm a product, like I said, of STEM. Uh, STEM. STEM has some limitations in that there is no glue that holds the science and the technology and the engineering and the mathematics together unless we have art. And a previous speaker today really just got into this, I think at a, almost a metaphysical level in, in conflating art and words, but um, STEAM is really gonna be the long-term answer. And this doesn't mean in a decoupled way, like, oh, I'm gonna take calculus and then later on I'll go take drawing. It means, all of these things get integrated in a much more thoughtful, human fashion, in a, in a much less decoupled, abstracted fashion that we have today. And because it's decoupled and abstracted, abstracted that's why small towns and, and cities and places like Washington are able to cut their arts programs and continue to get federal funding for their math programs. This is not Chevet, this is Lasco, so I'm not ripping anyone off, but the, <laughs> it, is, it, is, it is from the same era. And the point being that we really are hardwired for art. And, and we're thinking now that these might have been created over a very long period of time. And it's about narrative-driven design. In other lectures when I talk about design, I talk about how important the narrative is. Well, the narrative doesn't have any math in it. The narrative doesn't have any engineering in it. It doesn't have any science in it. And it usually doesn't have any technology in it. It's a story. And we've been hardwired, our brains, for hundreds of thousands of years to tell stories. Those are the ties that actually bind us socially. And that's why I think there's something in there, I can't quite put my finger on it, but there's something in there that's the key to solving all of this. I don't know if anyone uh, read Steve Jobs' recent biography, but he pretty famously, and I think somewhat counterintuitively, advocated for the reemergence of liberal arts in the world of technology. And then he felt very strongly that the success of Apple was due in large part to, the, to focus on liberal arts, to focus on, and, I do, and again, I don't just mean drawing, but think about the humanities here. And that, in fact, the union of those two things is what's allowed the kind of human-centric design that has made their brand and their products so successful today. At least that was his theory. You decide and think what you want. Look at this. No, no cell phones at school today. It's a big deal, because kids are screwing off and they're texting and everything else. Look, digital natives, they don't go online. They are online. If a kid has to go to school and feel like they have to unplug to be at school, then we've done something really weird in terms of ripping out a major apparatus of their learning ecosystem. And I'm not advocating that every kid sit there and, and, and screw off with a mobile device, but I think we need to I think we need to increasingly accept a future where these kinds of technologies are going to exist, not just in first world 
school rooms, but as we saw earlier, in every school room. And if you look at the growth of mobile in the third world, that'll tell you enough right there. And are we going to engage that as, as part of learning, as part of society, or are we going to be demagogues and try to make rules about it and, and get back to the old way of doing things? So I want to leave you with a, a, few, a few ideas. First, it's about enabling kids to learn. Kids are already hardwired for it. Um, and we need, to, we need to really let them learn through the whole self. And you can call that STEAM, or you can call it a, a million other things, and I'm sure there are other, other names for it, but enable them. Um, an example of that, I'm a, a docent at the Museum of Flight here in town. It's a big passion for me, so I get to see this every time I volunteer. This is a lot like Plato's garden, right? That's a lot like his cave in Lascaux. That's a lot like people sitting down and having a conversation, it looks to me a little bit more like kindergarten or maybe a progressive middle school, and a lot less like that slide we saw earlier of 400 undergrads learning statistics. This guy is, is, is I, I don't know if he's, what even his qualifications are, but I know that he is in a visceral and tangible way engaging his kids about flight, and he's doing it with things that like actually fly, for example, it's not a computer, it's completely analog interactive, because interactive doesn't have to be digital, that technology doesn't have to come on a screen. Um, it's very simple, and it's very effective, and I only bring it up because while I have no statistics, I have a, a first-person experience of seeing how successful it is. Getting back to those kids again, there's a, a, a bunch of research out there that suggests that kids at a very young, young age actually understand fractions. They, they relearn them, if any of you are parents, in like third and fourth and fifth grade, and they have a difficult time with them. But as kids, they have a tough time. Look at, the, look at these cars. We've got blue, green, yellow. Even the yellow has got, it's on a whole color continuum as well. Uh, it's got his palette figured out, dialed in, red on the end. Here's the world that we live in. Yes, I believe in the gamification of math, by the way. I don't believe that it took me 12 years of math to understand why it had any application to me in the real world. And that's even as an engineer and a physicist. And I bet you that that sorting algorithm that that startup engineer is writing on that wall on the right is never going to be as effective as the one those two kids are doing on those cars right now. One last point to think about. This is recently from the Times. The rich are getting richer, the poor are getting poorer, and it's making a difference in the quality of education that kids have. Closing thoughts. I won't read all of these to you. License to learn is important. The most important thing we can do is give our kids a framework for lifetime learning. I think that it does not exist to tell someone that if they just follow their passion, they'll get there. I think that they take something more, one other extra set of tools. I'd like for the teachers in here, and maybe the parents as well, to think about what the difference is between working for other people's dreams, even if that provides you lots of money and safety, versus spending a lifetime just learning. And finally, a classroom uh, doesn't learn, individuals do. And I'm not telling you anything you don't already know there. And you, can't, you aren't teaching unless you've taught an individual. And finally, I, I think that if we do not succeed in graduating kids that are emotionally content and economically independent, then this system is never going to be fixed for us. And I am so humbled by everyone here, including the speakers I've already heard today, in, in working together on however we might enable that to, to happen. Thank you for your time.